there are just some some notes over the the, the, tab, the chapters on uh, testing and on automated checking. And then the plan is to today spend maybe the first twenty to thirty minutes going just go slide like kind of summarizing the chapter and then spending the second half like doing some live coding demo type stuff uh, is the plan. Um, so I basically have a package and then we're just gonna like add some tests to it and check it and all of all of that fun stuff. Um, so let's get into our packages, testing on my checking. As mentioned, I think for I've been very bad about this in a lot of the packages that I have written previously. I think the only package I really did a lot of testing for was when I was giving a demonstration talk for Saturday uh, conference around building an R package. I did a lot of testing there, but in a lot of the ones that I have uh, work and stuff, I've, I, or I'm not about, about doing this. Um, so it was, it was good to read through this chapter. Uh, I've got the first version of this book, so I'm broadly familiar with like how to write tests, but it was good. And also I, uh, that 3.0 is out now right over some of the vignettes and tried to remove myself with the new version like that. So I guess level, like why, like why should you write tests? Um, so these are the four kind of reasons that the, uh, book gave for it. I think they're all good reasons for like the obvious one is, is fewer bugs and catching bugs earlier when you make changes to your code. So if you make a bunch of changes and like, you know, to, to functions you've written and it's, it's really hard to just, you don't want to just like find a bug when you have that use case and testing kind of like abstracts away and like basically runs all your code for common problems again uh, after you make any changes and makes it super automated, better code structure. Um, this is what, I forgot exactly what they mean by this, but I think it's like the way that test that is set up kind of structures it so that the corresponding tests to the, the function. So everything's very contained in like, uh, um, kind of laid out for you when you use the structure they recommend. Um, easier restarts, I meant by this was that, so if you kind of put a package and you're like building it and developing it and you put it on the back burner for a while uh, and then you come back to it like, you know, six months to a year later, like, and you might follow the nuances, like written a really good, good test for it, then you can kind of get back into developing without accidentally like, breaking everything with your new changes. Uh, and then robust just makes it so that, you know, it's, if it's well tested, it's robust in that it, uh, everything is expected and your users aren't going to encounter weird errors when trying to use it. And it really makes your life as a developer easier down the road. Um, so the workflow that the book ends is a test that package. I think the, the book is certainly, I don't know if they've gotten around to really updating this chapter at all yet, the original version of the book because there is definitely some recommendations to use functions that are totally like hard deprecated as of test that 3.0, uh, which is now I don't, um, and a cool thing with test that 3.0 that we'll get into in like the demo is like it, 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 it kind of introduces the idea of an addition, which is just when you add to your description file that specifies to use a new addition. And so the reason why you couldn't just, uh, you know, he had to do it this way is because basically Cran uses the newest version of test that to test everyone's code. And it some of the tests that previously passed break. So basically you have to opt into using this new edition. Uh, and every major version now like 4.0 will be a new edition. And he said he plans to like basically never do that. Um, so this is a big kind of like uh, update that was made very recently, um, like a week ago or something, like a week and a half ago, uh, this kind of 3.0.0 came out. Uh, so in the workflow you call to use this, use test that function, and it basically will set up most of the structure for you. Um, it kind of just like automatically puts like uh, the relevant things to your description file, will create the test tree for you and creates a script that kind of sets up the, the automated testing framework uh, that allow you to just use the keyboard shark for test that stuff. So, and I wanted to make a note that this book, and test that, which I would probably also recommend 
probably the most well-supported testing framework, but there are definitely other testing frameworks that are out there for R packages that you can use. I know one that looked kind of interesting to me was TinyTest. I think it's of, of kind of much more simple uh, way testing framework, but if you're using the use this kind of workflow that the book does, I would probably just use test that because in the, our studio is very really well integrated with those tests. Uh, there's other, you can go into like older packages, create packages and see what they do for testing. Like I looked at data.table and they're, they're te they basically have everything in just one giant 17,000 line file that just runs all the, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. It, that they just put in the inst, it was inst directory. Um, there's all kinds of different ways, but yeah, I'd recommend probably using test that. Um, and that's what the book talks about. So the structure. So a test in this test that directory uh, and it's created when you run the use, use this, use test that function. Uh, so then to create a new test within that directory, you use the use test function uh, and you just supply the file name uh, for that test. Uh, generally, you want it to be the same name as the corresponding R file in the R directory. So you can have one R file and then one test file and they like are one match. It'll make it a lot easier um, for you to like know which test function when you run your tests. Uh, it'll it'll automatically append test to that uh, file name, so you don't need to even do that. You can just pass the exact same thing to it. Um, and despite what it says, don't use the context function. It's deprecated in favor of using file names instead. Uh, so that's what I was saying. Uh, definitely, the the book's not super up to date. It's going to be interesting when they get around to uh, writing the rest of that, because I imagine they're going to have to say. Um, so then there's kind of three kind of late, like three unit, like, like lay, like peer testing or like a, whatever hierarchy you have three levels is like the, uh, the atom, the most basic thing and in the test that package, they're all just like expect on course something. Um, and it's basically saying, okay, I expect my code to do the X thing. Um, and then if it. So that's the basic. And then the, a test, unit test, is kind of uh, a more, like you, you group similar functionalities together as a unit test. And in test that, uh, the function to use is a test that. So you say test that, and then you put it like whatever, like you just name it, like test that this happens. And then you put all of your expectations that are together inside of that test that block. And then all of these, uh, blocks live together in a file. Um, and the file can be I think, named, it doesn't really matter, but it's, yeah, recommended that the files correspond to files in R. Um, but it, I, I guess that's like probably a, just a recommendation if you have a strong reason to like break them up in a way, still 100% work. Uh, I think the most important thing is making good names for your unit tests themselves so you can can know when things are failing. So expectation getting this a little bit more. So all of the, the expectation functions have two ints, the actual result and the expectation. A lot of them have a have kind of a default argument for the expectation, like expect true, like you don't need to say like that it's true. It's you just provide whatever you're doing in returns the thing, and then if it's true, then that test will pass. Uh, agree. It throws an error. One cool thing, a new type of test expect, expectation that was added in uh, test 0.0.0 that I'm going to show you in the demo that's pretty cool, I think, is the idea of a snapshot test. And so these are things that kind of you have to visually inspect. Like if you have like an output file or a plot that you want to work a certain way or like a, a kind of things of the, this nature where you basically want to go in after the test is run and does look good. It's not, it's something that's too easy to just like verify because the output's not necessarily R code. Uh, test that 3.0.0 allows you to do this very easily, which I think is cool. Uh, and then this is just some examples uh, of different expectations that you can use. There's expect equal, expect error, and they're very like aptly named. I think you should usually know what a thing is doing.
uh, with Adamson, there's LTE for less than or equal to, um, and then that snapshot output, which is for like writing a file. And the way it works is it just really just basically puts, like you need to do nothing besides like putting your function into this and then it'll create a file that you can go and check of all of your snapshots, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. So writing tests, uh, which is like writing unit tests. So each test should have an informative name uh, and cover a single unit of functionality. Um, and it, the book recommends to focus on texting the external interface to your functions. So like, don't necessarily check, like usually you wouldn't want to te like test things that your like users of your function are going to like kind of do. You don't necessarily need to test every single um, internal function that you have in your package. Um, test each behavior in only one test. So don't like, duplicate like your, your test just adds needless overhead. Um, this one, I thought interesting recommendation, and they didn't, it, if you really read the book, it didn't really expand much more on this. It said, avoid testing simple code, your comp will work. So really, if you just write perfect code, you never need to write an S. Um, always write a test when you discover a bug. I think this is a, a big one. So if you're working your code and you notice something's off, immediately write a test for that so that if it comes up again, you can catch it before yeah. it uh, kind of goes into... Uh, becoming a bigger problem for your users. Um, you can use, there's skip functions that allow you to conditionally skip a test. So you can say like, oh, if, if it, like, ir you know, if it's like not relevant, you can like skip. I think there's also a skip on CRAN uh, option that you can add to your tests if you don't want them to be run on CRAN. Um, Why? And then the book. Because they're like computationally uh, so intense. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I think the next slide is is getting over like what you should do if you're testing on CRAN. But it's I think the recommendation was if so if a test like runs over a minute, um, then you you shouldn't submit it to CRAN. I don't think they like that. Or also if it's something that you're testing something that's like specific to one machine, like how long something will take to run. Like if you want to test that like a function runs in under 10 seconds, like avoid avoid writing tests like that. Um, we don't know exactly how long your machines are going to take. Like things are on that. It could also Can be you? things like if it's um, running parallel code, uh, CRAN does not appreciate that. Um, because it's running many things on one machine. Mm -hmm. And then, um, like, if you're hitting something external, you might want to skip it on CRAN so that it doesn't fail just because they have some weird, you know, uh, weird setup. So then how does, like, fur have any tests? Uh, I'll bet a lot of fur is skip on CRAN. Yeah, it'd be interesting to go and read, read over. But, I mean, I don't think you need to have any tests to get something accepted on CRAN, so but it's still a good idea. Uh, so then sometimes it's useful to build your own testing tools to reduce duplication. Um, so this is just like, if you're running like one, you can like define new functions in your, your test files if you're like you over and over again. Um, or you can also create like custom expectation functions as well if you're using those like frequently. Um, like if you're constantly testing that something's equal to like some big, object like you can just easily write like a, a custom uh, expectation function for that and so they, they mentioned that that's sometimes a good idea to do yeah so the next rant um which we kind of already covered uh, so yeah they the book recommends if it if it doesn't run in under a minute it might have a call to skip on crayon oh tests are always run in the english language so if you have like weird characters i guess in your like test files that might mess up their stuff. Uh, in the end, like, uh, things are likely to be variable on CRAN, like how long something takes, numerical decision, or as John called out, uh, like running things in parallel might not be a great idea. Okay, so that's kind of summarizing the testing chapter. It was pretty short, actually. I, I, again, I'm really curious to see like what they ultimately kind of come up, because I, 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 I have the feeling that, that chapter, this chapter is in, in uh, and for a pretty major makeover to align with their changes they made and test that 3.0.0. Um, so that'll be exciting to see. <laughs> and hopefully it will uh, include some stuff on the mock package 
uh, which I'm going to try to show in the demo, but it's very confusing. Uh, I was very confused when I was trying to figure it out yesterday. Um, but they say that you definitely want to use use that package instead of the with mock test that function, which are now deprecated. So workflow for automated checking. Um, so what, what it basically checks your, your, your code for common problems. Uh, and the terminal command that this is, is R. I don't know if you're allowed to pronounce that command. I say R command check, RCMD check. Uh, so in dev tools, you can run dev tools check or just uh, control or command shift E in a video, which is a nice shortcut. Um, so it returns three types of different messages. There are errors for severe problems that you really need to fix no matter what you're doing. Uh, warnings are problems that you should probably fix. And then if you're submitting to CRAN, need to be fixed. They won't let any, any packages of warnings allowed on, on CRAN. And notes uh, are kind of mild problems. Uh, I think really recommended if you're trying to submit to CRAN to not have any notes, unless you have like a really good reason why there's a note. Uh, this is, I think, general recommendation there. So what does the check check? So it basically just checks everything back. In. So being with like Meta, which is just like our version running, like what's your operating system? Um, then it take, checks your package structure, like making sure, you know, you do your name the right thing and like all the structure is good. You don't have any files that are illegal in there in the build. Uh, then it checks your file meta information, which is all of that fun, like dependencies and you know your name, and then making sure that all of that's up and good. Um, create these. You can add flags when you're checking to like you really are trying to get on CRAN. I think there's like a as CRAN thing you can specify in DevTools check. Uh, then your namespace, uh, our code, like making sure your code like doesn't throw errors. But if you've been developing and testing in the normal way, it's probably unlikely that your code like just straight doesn't work. At least if you're at the point where you're running a, a, the check and checks the data uh, that's included in your package, it builds all documentation, uh, demos, I guess. I'm not exactly even sure. I've never made a demo in a package, but it checks that too, uh, checks all the compile code in the source directory, runs all of the tests, uh, except for the ones which you label as skip on CRAN, and then builds the vignettes. That's kind of all it does. And then the last kind of piece here is around continuous integration. Um, so the are basically, so every time you make a push of your code into GitHub, or GitLab or whatever remote repository you're using, it will kind of automatically run dev tools check on code or, or any arbitrary, like you can check and run whatever. Um, so use this has some functions for doing this. Um, use tra Travis is the one that the book talks about, but there's other continuous integration tools out there uh, like Circle CI and then which I've never heard of, but that's, I guess, another one. So you use those functions, you set up a config file, you commit and push to GitHub, and then you wait a few results for the, wait a few minutes for the results to be emailed. I will say I did try to do this with the package that I built the other day uh, for like the demo package I'm going to show, and it, it didn't work, uh, and I kind of gave up. But I'm sure, I'm sure uh, some of you guys have experience with, with uh, doing continuous integration. Uh, and yeah, you can do other cool stuff like publish a book, time source changes, which is of course what happening the uh, our packages book itself, or like building yets and publishing them to a website. I believe like the, I imagine like those automated like those our package websites also use this integration to like update all of that whenever you update the code. At least I assume. Okay, so I guess now we can go into a um, uh, just trying to write some tests and check our page and see what happens. Okay. Let me 
no, it's F eleven. We get so I have this. It's very oh god, that's very dark. I'm gonna turn this light. Um, Can you make your font like a hundred times bigger, please? How's it? Is this good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's always like I I was planning on doing that. Yeah, I can uh it can get really small on your screen because I have it on like the big big monitor. Um so sure. yeah, so what I That's have about it. <laughs> all right. So I have this package, like I have two kind of functions I already wrote. I want to make sure I'm on the right branch. I have this like demo branch checked out. Doesn't have all the tests already read. Okay, yeah. So this should be correct. This have any of the testing infrastructure in it yet at all. So I have these these two functions um, that I included in this package. There's plot dots, which is a function just uh, you kind of just supply an argument of how many dots you want to and then the arguments passed on to jump point and it'll just plot a little plot for you. And the main reason like I have this is because I want to show you guys how snapshot tests work. Uh, and then I have this function that I was, so I was trying to get uh, the mockery package to like work. And my dummy example I came up with was like a function that just like you supply it a DBI connection object and it just count numbers in a table name that you pass it. Um, because this is the kind of thing I think that like you would want to use mockery for, where it's like you don't want to be hitting your database every time you're like doing a test. Uh, I could not get this to do what I wanted. I did get some like very basic mockery stuff working, which I can show. But maybe like we can work through and see if we can we can write our own test for this. That that just, I was able to just like write a test that does hit the database, but I just want to see if we can one that doesn't. But first, let's uh, let's set up the testing infrastructure. So the first thing you want to do is just use test that. And I already used to use this. I think I actually have it in my R profile to attach whenever it's interactive. So this will set up a lot of our structure. So you can see that it uh, it added the test directory here. Uh, added, it added the test, suggest test that to our description file. Um, and then it creates some like very bare bones infrastructure that I don't think you ever really want to edit, which is this, this test that dot R, which always is just the like basically library test that library is your package and then runs this test check function. I don't know. I think maybe someone knows better. I've never messed with these files that I think it's recommended not to. So, and then just test that directory, which is currently empty, but to create a test. Uh, so as I said in the kind of presentation, I think it's recommended to kind of align tests with what you have your file's name in the R directory. Um, so let's just do one for plot dots. And you can see this is automatically going to create a file called test plot dots. Uh, it just automatically adds the test for you. Did I you know imagine it that you can just have plot dots open in your in your R Studio console and then just type use test and it'll create the appropriate. Oh really? Yeah. Oh really? Okay. So if I <laughs> if I this. So yeah, if you just do use test. There oh, you go. I didn't know that. I did not know that. That is nice. That really is like making it so you like, I mean, yeah, like it's easy to accidentally do a typo, not name something like, yeah, that's, that's actually really cool. Did not know that. Um, okay. So I guess we'll go back to our dots and it always just gives you this boilerplate, like test, uh, multiplication works and it'll always pass. So to run the tests, you can run dev tools, test, or just controller. T, which is what I usually do. This will obviously pass because I think plus two equals four. Um, you can add you can add things to this kind of uh, US that multiplication works. So we can ex like say expect uh, less than. Actually, I'm just going to library test. 
have to. So expect less than uh, two times two. Five. So test that. This will pass again. So and then if you have one that fails, like it'll kind of give you a formative message over here, letting you know and why it's like it's i think the, these messages are like very good in what they return like for this one like we can see like it's so it's we're testing the multiplications and the error is like very descriptive so 2.2 .2 is not strictly less than three and then tells you the difference and like kind of all of these functions work like this um so then we can add another test and this is the plot dots, so we can test that. It returns ggplot. Uh, we can, to use this, we can do the expect S3 class um, is one to use. And you can basically say plot dots, and then just specify the I think I think this is like the class that the GG is, if I remember right. We can see. I will fix actually I we can I'll fix this. So this is an example of a test. Oh, can say see, yeah, like that is actually the the correct uh actually I'm curious what happens if we only include Let's say we don't include the full one. It gives me a warning here. No, it just passes. Interesting. It's kind of surprising. But well, actually, wonder if we say. Oh, interesting. So I guess. I think there might be an, another argument to tell it how specific you're being? I can't remember for sure. Yeah, so it looks like the default behavior is if any of those classes are found. Yeah, no, so it just checks just, to see if it inherits. Yeah. So I, I wonder what, I guess you, I guess if you want to exactly what it is, you'd have to do like, ex, like, uh, you do expect, you expect equal. equal. Yeah. And then say like just take the class and then say like class plot dots. And then then you'd have to do the exact. So I guess that's probably the Yeah, so now this will definitely fail if I just say GG. Yeah. Okay, so that's good to know. That's actually kind of, I will say that's like a little bit of surprising behavior from expect S3 class. I would expect there at least to be an argument to like make it exactly match. So I guess, yeah. Uh, so now let's, let me see if I can show you guys the, the snapshot test. Uh, and this is really cool. I, I don't know what to name this. <laughs> Plot dots looks right. If any of you guys have a better name, that, let me know. <laughs> uh, so what you can do is you can say like expect snapshot output and let's say plot dots. And then, so the way to find plot dots is like, there's just additional arguments you can pass onto geom point. So let's say we want uh, size equals like 10. We want the dots to be really big. And let's say we only want we want 25 dots. Um, so what we can do is we run this test. What happens is it will actually. What is this hat saying? Oh. Well, here we go. This is another. So right now it's giving me an error saying, oh, this requires the third edition. Um, 
So what you need to do to get around that is you, it's just a line you put in your description file. Um, let's see. So I forget exactly what it is, but I have the, the vignettes uh, in another screen that tells you. So there's. <laughs> Here's all the there's a lot of good vignettes for for test for the new test set, uh, including test set three e and then for snapshot tests. Uh, so if if you read over this, it tells you what to do. So well, what? Oh my god! All right, I guess I have to need to, to have the expired or whatever. Browse vignettes test set. All right, there we go. So now we go back. I don't know why it didn't work before. So what you can do is you just, it has the line you need to add. OK, yeah. So the way to activate third edition is this line to your description file. Literally just need to copy paste it in there. Uh, so now we can try to run our tests again, and they should not. Do they have a, a use this update for test that three yet? Do you know? Um, I I don't think so because I looked for, I, I've updated uses pretty recently. Um, and I looked for, uh, like I assume there'd just be like a use test that third edition that like, <laughs> it automatically adds that line for you. And I don't think there is, but I 100% guarantee that there's gonna be at least like an argument you can add to use test that in the future that will like put mine in here for you so you don't have to like go and navigate to the vignette and or memorize that exact <laughs> that exact line. Mm -hmm. um, so now give me a warning. I'm curious why it gave me a warning there. But uh, so now we can go to our tests um, and it gives you this plots uh, Kind of thing. So this is the idea behind these snapshot tests. Is like, okay, like we want to check and visually inspect to see if the dots look right. Um, and if we go here, it'll we bring up this PDF and look at our look at our dots and look at how big they are. Uh, and then you can add other things to the snapshot output. Um, Let's say let's say color equals blue. Um, and run these tests again, and then it'll update our snapshot with all of the plots, um, kind of there. I'm not sure why it's giving me a warning. Does anyone know? So snapshots work that they take a snapshot the first time you run the test. Um, and then every time you run a test thereafter with the same arguments, it should run, like it should test against the same one. So you notice like that second oh. time, it gave you the blue dots one, but not gotcha. the Gotcha, so if I run it back, now, you should okay, have no warnings. That, yep. that makes total sense. Oh, that adds even a, a layer. Okay, so if... I run this snapshot test and it's like, I don't even need to check it if there's no warnings. If there's a warning, like maybe I can go check and see if it looks weird. Um, that's cool. So you can see, oh, here are blue dots, here are big dots. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, so then there's this count records. Or this, where's my test count records? Um, so yeah, I was trying to get like uh mockery to work and it yeah like i was it's very confusing um is, is my main my main takeaway it took me a while to even get like the to understand the example in like the readme of the repo um but i did eventually get that i still am not entirely clear how you would use it to uh kind of test uh, like an actual use case or like why you would want, like how, like why you'd want to, like when, when would it make sense to do and like how it works. Uh, but the general idea is uh, there's, what is it, library? So it's a package called Mockery. Um, so there's, there's kind of two like uh, ideas 
in this this package. Like one is like the there's this mock function, um, which I definitely under, like, understand how that what that mock function is. Do. So what the mock function does is there's like so basically, let's call it M. So it creates this function that always returns whatever you pass it. Like so, we'll, we'll just say we'll do a simple thing. So we'll say this. So this create a function. Let's take a function. Directory, and then it always will return this. But if you don't cycle it, it'll like give you an error if you call it like more than once. So if I do this once, it'll give me true. But if I run it again, it'll like tell me that I ran it too many times. So then the kind of idea is you take these mock functions and you substitute them in for like other functions within a function that you want to substitute like number of times. If you want to like, if your function is calling it like multiple times, you want to like add the cycle or whatever, but the idea is like you call the mock function once and then it go to like normal behavior and it it works. There's some you know magic with environments and stuff, so it just it just only manipulates things inside of the kind of block of code. Uh, so very simple example. This has nothing to do with any of the functions that are actually in my package, like the get counts. But I think uh, now actually I I totally. I'm not going to be able to to do this like from memory, so I'm just going to check out my <laughs> my branch where I already did this. Uh, but oh, hold on. Hmm. I'm just going to restore everything. Hmm. All right. Get rid of that. Oh my God. All right. I guess I'm not going to try to triage this Git issue. But so I guess maybe we can. Why did Git you can try running a uh, git stash first and then check out the. Yeah, I'm just going to get. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to stash it. I actually use git stash. Huh. I don't know why it's. Oh, it's because they're not added. I'm just going to just whatever. <laughs> To add them before you stash them, I think you do. Okay. All right. Did we we lose? Of mockery that I was doing. So we define this function get name, which is literally just taking whatever you pass it and uh, returning that same thing. So it's like, okay, you just pass it a name and it returns a name. Uh, and then we have the introduction function that just takes this calls this get name function and uh, like says a little introduction. So then I have this demonstrate stubbing test. So what we do is we mock uh, create function David, which is a mock. So it's just going to return David once um, we if we call it more than once it'll it'll throw an error um, but then there's this stub function which is like I think kind of the main the main function of mockery it seemed like and the one like when I was I was also just looking at like the reverse dependencies of mockery and like reading all the packages that had it and just seeing if that triggered something in like my understanding and I didn't quite get it until I just, I was able to eventually get the very simple example I have here. But yeah, I, I'm curious to see if anyone else has any, or like a good use case, uh, or if we can maybe solve, solve this. Uh, but so what this stub function does is it's saying, okay, so we want to take any time you're within the function, say introduction from within this like we want the get name function to be stubbed out 
for this mocked David function that we just created, right? You can also make this so that it, like, you don't need to do this here, actually. You, like, just specify this as text. It will create, the stub function will create a function that just always returns David. But I think this is, like, makes it a little bit more clear what's happening. So there's this David function that you're stubbing in from whenever the get name function is in the same introduction. Then what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're saying we want it to, like, expecting these to be equal. Uh, so say introduction, John, we passing it, like normally if you were just running this, like it would just say, hello, my name is John. But we're saying because we stubbed it out, the get function with from within the say introduction uh, with this data function, David, we're going to expect the return this, expect these to be equal. Uh, then you, there's this mock function called expect called, which you can see test whether like, oh, was this David, this mocked function like ever called? Uh, and the number of times it was called is the second argument here. Um, so test actually passes. Um, you can see. But if we, if we change this, even though it's what it would normally return. Um, so that's the gist of how like stub works. Um, so then I was trying to like my original, like, okay, so can we use this to like basically have this, this count records function that I made like work with, uh, work with mockery. So the, the way you do that mockery is you would have to like create this connection. Um, like for here, I'm writing a table, but assume like it's a little database that you have somewhere. Then you have to run the function and test that it's like returning the right thing and just do all of these things. Um, in this example, it doesn't really matter because it's such a simple, like it's accounting records is like even even in a real example, like it's probably fine to not going to be too computationally expensive. But like I was in the instance of if you have a function that like is doing something in a database and returning something, but it is a lot like more um, like computationally expensive and such to be able to test it without like some huge expensive query every time. Like how would that, how would you do that? But so far, like this is how I would write a test. I'm just wondering if there's a better way. Or is this, it could be the case, this just isn't a use case where you can really use mockery. I don't know if anyone has any oh, thoughts. Yeah, we use this at work. Um, and one way to think about when to use mockery or not is um, like, do you really need to test that DB write table works? Like you don't, right? Like DBI, the DBI package is already mm -hmm. figured out that, that DB write table works. So you, we just use it to make sure that we passed all the right stuff to that to that uh, function, but oh. we're not actually like trying to test that DB write table works. And also we don't want to like, um, you know, put a bunch of, of these little tables in our in our database. Um, but that's like one way that exactly. we can do mockery is like, I don't actually need to test that that function works. I just need to make sure I pass the three right arguments. Um, I don't remember what function, we don't use stub for that one. Um, it's similar to like your expect called. There's like a- Is it, is it with mock? Yeah, I can I can pull it up. Um, yeah, so there's test that with mock, which is uh is actually um, it's deprecated. It's deprecated, right? yeah. So it's like mock, it's recommended to use mockery now. But I think yeah. you're like now actually that like that actually makes a ton of sense. And I think I was thinking about this the wrong like I, the wrong way. I, I I think I was trying to use it for something where I don't think necessarily can use mockery to test this count records function that I have. Because it is like you really I don't think any way to like not hit the database and check that it works. But yeah, it is just making so, sure like DBI. It's, it's checking to make sure like this, like that the database spec like its expectations. I think that's a good point. So what we do is we use mock. Um, so we just say like db mock is mock, and then we stub it. So we stub the, the db 
Let me see yours. Yeah, we still have the DB Connect. Um, let me see if I can just copy this over. I don't want to get anything I shouldn't from this. <laughs> can you mock, can you stub out DB write table um, inside your count records function? So that when you pass it empty cars and con, it passes. Uh, well, the DB, the DB write table is not part of the, so all the function does is like counts records in a table. This is just like. So yeah. can you show me the function again? I. Like this is this is uh, this DB write table is literally just to create this ephemeral database where I can like in a real instance like you wouldn't even be calling that at all. Sorry, I think I meant DB get query. I think is what is what's inside count records. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can yeah. you stub? Oh, out? so you're saying? Oh, yeah. Should, stub oh, out. That's, yeah, that's oh. DB get query <laughs> so that it always returns whatever number you tell it to return when you pass it empty cars or something like that. Ooh. Yep. Ooh, so that's that, what that's, that's how you would stub that, I think. I think you're right. Well, let's see if we can do this. Um, and then the idea is what you can do is, um, you know, stub for each test what, like, get the return once from the database, and just then you make a stub that returns whatever that return was from the database. Any processing you're doing inside of your function, um, doesn't matter anymore. Or, or is what you're testing basically. It's just the processing that's in the function, not the get query. So let's see if you can make it work. So you're like, do we still have to like, cause this, I think we still, ha like, we still have to. You, show me count records. Do I, know, I don't remember exactly what count records is. Yeah, all yeah. it's doing is just like, so you get a connection, which is a DBI connection object. And yeah. then a table name, and then it just like counts the records from that table in like the remote remote database. That's the idea. So the easiest thing to do would be to stub DBI to DB get query to no matter what return five or whatever number you want. Okay, so so we want to say from within when we're calling it from get counts DBI DB get is your function count records though? It totally is. <laughs> <laughs> so do you get query and then we just want it to always like return five. Okay, so. And then you could scrap all the stuff before that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you might need con, but you could just. Yeah, we need to, do we need to stub con? Like how, how can we? You just put some dummy. Like, I mean, it doesn't put matter null. what you pass in. Yeah, one. Um, well, let's see. That's a good point. I'm not sure if it does. You might try to evaluate con first. Ah, uh, no. Wait, never mind. It. I remember it's our stuck. advanced R. Yeah. Con will never actually get called, so it probably won't matter. Let's see yeah. if this. <laughs> see if this works. I think it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Wow. That totally makes, like, I was struggling so hard with, like, grokking this stuff last night. Thanks. This is, like, great. That, like, uh, helped me a ton. All right. Yeah, this is something that I've been trying to get myself to really wrap my head around because I have so many functions that I need to do this to. Yeah, basically. I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> So like, I, I, yeah. put, I put a little sample of how we use it. Um, so we use expect args. So there's like a lot of defaults that we send along to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know there's an expect args as part of uh, mockery. Um, it's kind of like, it's like also like this expect called. We're going to like test to see if this was called in the test, but this looks like it. Expect args. Oh, then you just in in this you just specify like the the arguments mm -hmm. as like a list. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, makes sense. Well, not uh, not as a list. You like just put them in as the name of the like the dot 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 is the name of the arguments. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. I put it in the chat um, if you want to look at that. At some point. Yeah. No, that makes sense. It's dot dot dot. You wouldn't use a, a list. Okay. Cool. Um, 
So I guess that's like some tests. Uh, yeah, I, I think the basic kind of workflow of test side is pretty, uh, like this mockery stuff aside, like is pretty easy to kind of wrap your head around. Like you're just, <laughs> it's just an expectation and then like a, a, a something your function returns and then you can just, and I think these little, uh, it's very helpful to see um, the kind of little output here that you get in your build. Um, so I guess now we can try to like uh, build this package or check it. Um, and I had it before so that, so if you, um, let me, I'm gonna just delete this file so that it, uh, I get the note when I check it, which I think was interest something I hadn't considered. Uh, wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so if you do it with like, so I have here in, in this uh, plot dots, it's like creating this data frame from within the, uh, actually we can get rid of this too. This will also like, make it make it doesn't like that so i'm creating this like data frame from within this function um and this this will give you a note when you when you i meant to hit uh so let me so command shift e to check uh so this takes a second to run everything there's like a big i think i went over in the kind of presentation, but it does a bunch of, does all the checks, make sure like, and, you know, wow. stuff here. And, and then it's not, um, it, it's not any worse, but it's not any worse than Munger's site as far as the crime and the There it is. You can see it. <laughs> yep. Like within a function and it always like works, I get for lack of a better, like unless, you know, but it gives, it gives a, a, a note, which I think if you're submitting to CRAN, you want to get that to go away. Um, and then it also like says add like import from, like, I don't get that. Like this, like stats is a like default package. I don't know why you would ever add like import from, but you can, I found that like, if you're using a function of stats package, like you want to get rid of the note, like this yeah. fixes that issue. So technically, someone could make an installation of R that doesn't have stats. Like, it's possible for that to exist. It's a default package, but, it, you know, you, you can build a, a system that has your package but doesn't have stats. It's not likely, but they could. So that's why also, that's there. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't notice, like, you, you don't need to, like, add it to the description. Like so you don't have to say like use package stats and I don't think you'd want to do that. Hmm. Uh, and it will just run without a note. So I found just doing this, like adding the namespace qualifier seems to fix it. So, but then it's still, we still have the issue of these, these global variables. And there's like, this seems very hacky, but there's like this function called global variables that you can just like create. So you can say like, I deleted this file, but like, create like a global, if, but this can be in any of your, um, I think it can be in any of your uh, uh, scripts, but if you just add utils, this global variables function, and then just like list as characters, like all of the rules, this, this gets rid of that note. Do you know the, uh, so now if we check. do you know the non-hacky way to deal with those? I just recently learned this. The, you want I the don't. data pronoun. If you use the data pronoun, you don't have to use the hack. 
Well, you still have to use it to hack for some things, but and it, almost and, never. And it's no, I mean, for anything that's not tidy, like if you do right. a data table, you would have to. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I'm actually really excited that we're talking about this because I have a global variables file that's like very long and it made my checks happy, but what the hell, what is this? So if you do um, import from rlang.data in the, uh, you know, in the, the Roxygen block and then Use dot data as yeah, I can. The, I can stop sharing my screen if you want to share. Um, I just put it in the chat because it, and then it's literally just you do dot data dollar sign x, and it'll find like what is the data frame at this point in the tidy pipe, and that what? is what dot data okay, means. Um, I guess that makes sense, but kind of. But like, what is this? What is this function? What is this doing for you? you so it's a, a convenient fiction to make it to make sure that it's looking at the data frame, not at the environment. And so it's it's a way to tell uh, tidyverse functions. No, seriously, I mean the data frame. So the x that's in the data frame. Not Are the you x asking that's about global variables, Maya? Is yeah. That well, so global variables is just putting a thing called X. It's saying that I have a thing defined called X. Don't freak out about it. So it's your list of things not to freak out about. Yeah. And like, I I'm don't sure see this file other. in any like our studio official package. How are they getting yeah. around? Yeah, that? I'm pretty sure this global variables is exclusively like to please our command check. They don't think yeah. it does anything else. You can just look at the help file. Yeah, so it. <laughs> it just says it's just yeah. for So, checking. like, no one's going to judge you if this file is 15 lines long or whatever. Well, my uh, it's generally not best practice for, I think there's a reason. Um, sometimes I think you can, like, override what the X is if it's, like, someone's yeah, it's what into it. actually be doing? So, in this case of X and Y, we should be calling those different things inside the package you should be using the data pronoun in this case before dot data this was the solution right correct i learned it's the solution it's, hacky. it's just it's hacky it's just it's crappy but Jenny Bryan. it was the solution so if you go yeah. back to plot dots yeah so i'm just creating this like data frame in the function that oh makes... yeah. so the reason why is because if you look at the way ggplot takes the aesthetic argument x and y they are quoted unquoted um objects and not characters so it could refer to any like number of things so um our command check complains about it but if you put dot data dot y and you just import dot data, it kind of like overrides with like the data masking part of tidyverse to say look in dot data dot data is a function or mm. an object from <laughs> our lang okay, and okay, okay. look there for everything that you prefix with dot data. It's just so the like, your land is what made does it's that not does this work in ggplot though? Thing. I don't think it would. Would it? I'm uh, pretty certain it does. Let's see. You'll need to import dot data because yeah. it won't know what to do with it without. I think. So, oh. if you have any function that assumes that dot, like that dot data, but you just didn't write it out, you need to put it in. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. It's because like of quadrant is exactly is, is, <laughs> is exactly why. So, if you look at the the chat, David. Yeah, where's the? Hold on. It's like always hard to like find the zoom chat when you're sharing oh here yeah we there's a lot oh, there's, there's a lot of chats <laughs> yeah just look at the very <laughs> bottom <laughs> okay so you just add so up in your rocks like, gen. you just add us yeah. the rocks gen. yeah and you'll have to use um or import our lang as well in your description but so this yeah. is like the formal, like perfect way to get rid of this. 
I've started doing it because the other thing it does is the reason it's a problem is technically if you, if you have a variable named X in your environment, it's ambiguous whether you mean that variable or X in the data frame. But this makes it unambiguous. It's, you definitely mean the X that's in the data frame, not the X that's in, you know, my global environment or whatever. I'm confused though, because that aesthetic X isn't in your environment. It's a like, it's like a closure in its own little world. So R freaks out the moment it sees a closure, unless it Whoa. is explicitly designed, uh, defined in your well, function or in the arguments. And remember that, of I that mean, that's global. in... It's an argument named X that you're saying is X, but you really mean it's this specific X. Like if if in the line above that he had said um, X equals two, and then you say ggplot2 aesthetic X equals X, it's like, wait, did, did you mean X or did you mean that X? Yeah, yeah. And so that's why those exist. They say to use them for programming because that way it's, you can't have some weird situation where something with the user's environment makes it choose the wrong X. So okay. that's why those exist. That makes sense. Because in a prior one of, I don't know, I like binge watched these. <laughs> Someone was saying, you really shouldn't have objects in your package, except unless you're including data, I guess. Or is that a false, is that fake news? It's, uh, you don't want to define an object kind of willy-nilly. Like you want to explicitly do it with use this, use data, or use, you know, create the actual data object. So um, yeah, I think this was helpful. Because of some confusion. There was like, in your code, in your second example, an X equals two, which I never did. But the dot data dollar sign X is pretty ubiquitous in tidy land. Yeah. So, I mean, that'll fix it for any tidyverse package. Um, like Tyler said, there are other cases where you can run into these, but mm -hmm. I mean, mine are 99% tidyverse related. And so I've gotten in the habit of doing dot data and I actually try to remember to do dot env explicitly now in tidyverse functions for the same reason that just make it unambiguous that this yeah. is the thing in the environment. This is the thing in the data. Don't, you know, don't just uh, assume that it's going to pick the right one. But this is crossing over into the other book club, um, <laughs> chapter 19 or so. I had a different question, David. Before you, like, started, you mentioned about having some kind of test thing in your R profile. What What do you what you throw in there? Just curious. I think I just was saying that I have, if it's an interactive session, I attach use this. Oh, oh. Cool. Because I think like for things that you're only ever using like in the console, like I, I've used this in like, I also have the package FS, like I, if it's interactive, uh, but if I, which I do sometimes put in scripts, but I, I make sure to <laughs> Library, library. If I'm doing that, I was wondering where you, you pulled out the file deletes. You know, with the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just use them all the time. Like, yeah, they're cool. Like just from the console to do random things. Very cool. Oh well, I just I, the time flew by. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that all that stuff stuff is not covered in the chapter, right? I actually didn't read the chapter, so <laughs> it is not. Yeah. Uh, Anything around like test set three, like it's, it is very outdated. I think actually in the, the chapter on uh, automated checking, like in there, like, oh, they're, when they're explaining like the things it checks, they're like, oh, it checks your R version. And like the example was R like 3.1 point like one or something. Right. Yeah. It's uh, those two chapters definitely haven't been updated. And I think that's most of the chapters we have left. We're going to be ahead of the update. And so I, I really appreciate that you, you know, dug in and presented 
like a hypothetical future version of the chapter. <laughs> yeah, and like I was saying, I, I'm I think it, I, I'm excited for this chapter when I do finish it because I feel like it's going to be a good reference this, yeah. for sure. I have another question about importing. So when you say to do import from rlang.data, do you have to do do you have to import from for every function or once and done for the package? Once and done. Um, sometimes I'll do it in a special file. Depends on the thing. Usually for dot data, what I end up doing is I just put it in some random function, and then later I'm uh, when I can't remember if I've done it already, then I explicitly go through and put it somewhere pretty. Um, you have like an import dot r. Uh, I put or, in utils. Yeah, utils.r or import.r or re-exports for re-exports, but I don't re-export data. Okay. Um, and then you do also have to import that package, rlang, when you're doing that. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know, it just makes my code feel safer. <laughs> so it takes longer to import rlang than it would to load this global variables file technically true but it's not prettier there are best practice reasons not to use global variables um but yes i mean it looks ugly so i'm gonna get rid of it <laughs> yeah it just feels very like it's literally like it's something that just exists to like quash errors is always exactly kind of like, yeah <laughs> I feel dirty. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, okay, then when you have a bunch of functions that are like, is that true for just importing dot data or for anything that a lot of functions are going to use, you just put it all in the utils? For instance, I know, Tan, close your ears, but like if you're going to make a Golem app, you're importing shiny all over the place, or you just import from once, bada bing, bada boom, done. Uh, once, and that again, that is the case where I would consider just importing shiny because yeah. there's so much of it. But yeah, yeah, yeah only once. Don't Got import it. it. I mean, Roxygen figures it out and it only actually imports it once, but mm -hmm. it clutters up your code. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a I'm and, an, yeah. I was importing over and over again and also name colon coloning. Oh yeah, I I colon colon except for the oh. dot data uh pipe. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Or or things I'm gonna use a ton of I you thought know, you had many to times. Both. So I'm gonna clean up. Yeah. Some people do both again i think for kind of explicit i think I golem's know. a case where i would actually depend on shiny like it's physically impossible to run the app without shiny so you may as well just depend on it that i don't know if that true i don't know if that would what's the difference so it depends libraries the other package when you library your package like is that a your Roxygen at depends? Is that a thing? No, it's a description it's thing. thing. Like it's use in the description file depends. Yeah, you can just yeah. use use package and then say depends and then it'll yell at you and ask if you're if you're using use this. Okay. <laughs> Wait a second. So you don't so the things in your namespace you don't need to also put it as a dependency? You you do, but you have to put it as an as imports in your description, not as depends. It depends dependency. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Type of dependency. Got it. Depends. Yeah. Import suggested. Ex yep. Yeah. Uh, so wait, if you depend on something, do you also need to import the namespace inside your package? Have we done that? Um, no, I, you do not. I'm pretty sure you don't. Oh, well. Because Thank depends you. is literally like. It is there, it, like it, it's loaded, the, it's attached. But it might be ambiguous like because someone you... might load something else, right? Yeah, it doesn't guarantee where it is in the search path. That's true. Best practice would also import Shiny as well, probably. 
So if you depend on shiny, you no longer need it in the import bucket. That's what we're. I don't. I never Let's depend. I don't know. Let's let's try it. Not now. Yeah. This is over. But maybe in Slackland. Yeah. But I think it, I think it's one of these things where if you do depend I, shiny, unless you've like loaded shiny and then loaded another package that overwrote a function in shiny and then loaded your package, then right. it could be weird. Like if it looks in the search path, but looks at that package instead of shiny. I kind of imagine it, it like if you depend on it, it also imports it. Yeah, that would break my mental model if it doesn't. Hmm. <laughs> yes, I try to think of like you know the situations where you would need the user to have the library loaded. Yeah. To use your package. Is there also a max amount of imports before you're getting greedy? Technically, I don't remember. We talked about this, I think. But... Oh, right, right. That's what someone said. Like. Uh... A thousand or something. Yeah, Cran has set a limit. It's not a thousand. Yeah. It's not ten. <laughs> it's somewhere in between. And I think it's a soft limit, but it's you get cheap by importing the tidyverse, or is that a frowned upon thing in package development? Very frowned upon. It's frowned upon to import tidy. Yeah. yeah. Frowned upon by the tidyverse team. For one thing, you don't you probably don't need everything that's in there. Um and it's you don't it, it is a trick package it's a hack package like it, it does its trickiness things so don't pretend it's a package it doesn't export any functions yeah so um actually i don't even think that would work because it doesn't export the functions right that makes sense it would make the install work but not the actual use because it's run on attach and you don't attach tidyverse right <laughs> still don't get what that file does but... so if you if you imp if you import rlang itself that's 470 but you don't import rlang in the in your package you You're just import importing... that one function no but you one could import you... everything if you want to oh, I mean. oh yeah you totally could that would <laughs> that would make your dot dot dots like ridiculous so <laughs> Or your colon, 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 sorry. Yeah. Yeah, don't do that either. <laughs> you, yeah. Wait, you still don't get the unattached thing? Yeah, no. I don't get it. Okay, so when you explicitly call library tidy first, what you are telling it to do is, like, what you think it's doing is load all these packages as well. But it, like, it... So in order to do that, it loads those packages, whatever you call library tidyverse, and then you get that like long ass message about all the functions that and all the packages that it's loading and so on. Okay. So that's where, like, that's where you would write a function that like every time you load library, you could like, you know, say hello or you know add where like David Robinson or whatever would be like every time you attach that package, it would like have an ad message like this is best this this is by david robinson please consider supporting me blah 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 right like that's where you would put bloatware like that and it's basically anytime you run library the package do that but if you don't want it to do um do that like when every time you call a function then you would put it in on attach but if you want it to run every time any function is run and loaded that namespace you can do on load and have it spit your adware out or something like that. <laughs> Got it. So it's to, you can be really annoying with those functions. Cool. Yeah, Usually unload can is be helpful, but yes. yeah, you want <laughs> to do, unload is stuff that is needed for your package to operate and unattach is also things that just are convenience or whatever should have should people should know about for your package. So yeah. can you wrap library tidyverse in a like suppress warnings and that would. But because it's not that's not really a warning. Like, what is that? Yeah, you can suppress package it's startup messages. That. It, oh. or you could just load conflicted, and it actually just stops complaining. Apparently, you could do suppress, suppress message. 
Sorry, is that a tidy verse? Is that an argument? Or is uh, that conflicted is a package. It's a package. But it's actually specifically handled in the I looked at the attach. I can share my screen. <laughs> So in the, um, so in the, this is the on attach file, um, basically, or sorry, it's not the on attach. The on attach is the ZZZ here. And basically this is what happens every time you run library tidyverse, it goes to this core, it looks for whether it's attached. If length needed is equal to zero, then don't, then don't do anything. Um, and then otherwise attach. And then if if package conflicted is in search, you can hide all the tidyverse conflict messages. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, message startup, true, blah, blah, blah. And then like, it just specially handles the um, on attach messages. Okay, that makes sense. And this is basically like probably the only usage of on attach I can think of other than adware. <laughs> um, when you ask for contrived examples, that would actually make sense. Um, if you remember, I made a package and it needs an environment because I wanted to rate limit inside of it. Um, I, I need to put that rate limit into an environment when it is, um, loaded. So. That's very fancy. Very it does the same it like basically when you load the package do these things uh same thing zzzr is this is the convention for the onload i think that's because it's sourced last in your build or your library or something so like after everything is done do this onload thing um and i'm memoizing a bunch of things and setting rate limits and so on so um uh -huh put all this stuff into the package environment or the user's environment or whatever when my when my package is loaded. So anytime you call any function for my package, whether it's namespaced or libraried or whatever, do this stuff. And that's usually what you'll want in terms of special attached things. You generally don't want attached things unless it's um, basically library this package to also library a bunch of other packages, yeah. um, which yeah. I think Sebastian Carl mentioned something about in either on Twitter or on Slack or something here, um, that he was making a personal package to do tidyverse, but also a bunch of other things that he liked to load every time. Does Cran care about these things? It's cool with the with this file? Yes, it is designed by Cran. Well, it's a, it's a it's an R package thing. Like it's not an R Studio thing. It's like an R like dedicated function. It looks for this on load function and the dot on attach function. Yeah, I guess I meant like Cran is cool with like spamming the people that. Oh, they're not, but they sort of check. I don't know if they. I I, I Cran's like tightness of checking can be variable. Yeah, like, are they going to look for someone saying, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if David Robinson tried to submit his adware package to Cran. I'm guessing he didn't. <laughs> uh, but that is the first I've heard of anyone trying to do that. Yeah. But yeah, and I don't think you can actually submit, like, a personal package to Cran, like your own, well, I guess... Frank Carroll yeah, did, so HMISC definitely exists. So I guess, yeah, they all can go to Cran if you wanted to try it. This was super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. Um, it's 9.30, so... We should break. I think John CD is doing the thing. Yes. Um, so next week, uh, Yanni CD is going to talk about GitHub Actions for us, um, which is very cool because I don't know how GitHub Actions work. And he has done, um, he has his Slackverse that I've helped him with that we use for like the mentor dashboard for um, 
or for DS. And it's, I don't know what it's at right now, like eight packages. And he has GitHub Actions set up that if you change something in one of the like early packages, it checks all the dependencies to make sure you didn't break anything. So um, we'll see if we get that far. Like that's a very weird use case, but it shows how cool you can make things with GitHub Actions. So that's actually not a very complicated test, right? Like I just well, uh, run test that or use this test rev depths. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll see. No spoilers. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, David. That was awesome. <sighs> yeah, yes. no problem. Yeah, thank you so much for the, all the um, test that three stuff. It was it was good to see that. Yeah, the snapshots are pretty mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah, and you can like any like any type of output file will like go there, which is which is like not just ggplots. Like it's robust, but you can can do. Sick. All right. Well, have a good night, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>